If on trial for murder, apparently the best defense is self-defense. You have to have done it, or else your survival would be in question. For Israel, claims of self-defense have been its go-to excuse, an excuse that underlies all its questionable acts, crying out that an existential threat was at its doorsteps, a perpetual existential threat that always appears but never materializes or never ends, a threat no matter the scale would often be exaggerated or even untrue. Whether it's a small dog threatening to bite or an even smaller dog simply barking way too loudly for its size. Shouting self-defense, disproportionate reaction from Israel would come. Definitely not with a muzzle to stop the barking or potential biting, but with a one-way ticket putting the poor dog to sleep. And it's this disproportionate response that should have gotten Israel into serious trouble over the years and in the crosshairs of international law. But to be on trial, one has to believe that one is accountable to those courts in the first place. And this is where the topic of this video comes into play. The establishment of Israel was founded on international laws being enacted by institutions that were meant to enforce such law. The League of Nations after World War I and the United Nations post-World War II. Global organizations that were destined to preserve and maintain international peace and security around the world. These laws that came into effect and that related to Israel were biased and unfair laws. Laws that were unilaterally in favor of the creation of a Jewish nation at the expense of another indigenous people, their rights and their lands. Of all the nations across the world, one would think that Israel had a deep and foundational respect for such institutions, that it would hold dear these organizations that it owed its existence to. But it doesn't, and since 1920, when the concept of an official set of international laws came about in the form of the establishment of the League of Nations, there was a gradual yet significant strategic and intentional shift in the Jewish nation's position. In this video, I'd like to go through the various progressions of Israel's behavior throughout history, as well as that of its representatives, pre-establishment, and to shed light on why such a shift materialized. Before any Israel came into existence, and by the end of the 19th and up to the early parts of the 20th century, there was a Zionist world organization that led the Jewish push for the creation of a national homeland. But after the Balfour Declaration in 1917 and the establishment of the League of Nations in 1920, one of the first major decisions by this international organization was a charter concerning the creation of Israel, within the approval of the Mandate for Palestine that also incorporated the Balfour Declaration into law. Not only was this a significant step forward for the Zionist organization, but this mandate in its fourth article lists out the necessity for the creation of a Jewish agency for Palestine that will advise and cooperate with the British mandatory for the establishment of a Jewish nation. Imagine that, an international institution, a defender of order and peace, with no Arab or Muslim member nation at the time, proactively creating an official counterpart to the British Empire for the establishment of a Jewish nation, facilitating immigration, governance, economic concessions, and so on for the Jewish people. Oh, and by the way, there's no Arab-Palestinian counterpart mentioned or nominated in the mandate, as if there was no need to recognize that any other people's rights did indeed exist. Of course, the Zionist organization was going to accept and adhere to such a mandate and law. There was zero downside for it. The League took a rogue unilateral declaration by the British and turned it into international law. The mandate materialized a new official partner in the Jewish agency that would make it extremely easy for the Zionists to maximize the positives while avoiding the negatives and whatever the British had proposed to do. Don't forget to join the Chronicles by subscribing to the channel. And like it if you do actually like it. And by clicking the notification button, you'll be up to date on all new releases. The Jewish Agency may be the only such organization in the world that has a special charter under international law, one that was readopted by the United Nations as part of a general assimilation of the surviving elements of the League of Nations that were deemed worthy of continuing on after World War II. And in its first resolution concerning Israel in November 1947, the United Nations proposed and approved Resolution 181 recommending the partitioning of the British Mandate for Palestine into an Arab and Jewish state. And that was that. 
fait accompli. With the declaration of independence of Israel in May 1948, that was the end for Zionists. The end in terms of the need for such institutions, for respecting their decisions or laws any longer. The end had been achieved. The creation of Israel had been realized. This was the moment when everything shifted. From a nation and people that saw their hopes and dreams reside in the United Nations would now turn a cold shoulder to the same organization. And the list of resolutions came, and they came fast. Criticizing the Israeli nation for acts of inhumanity or violence, yet these legal cries fell on deaf Zionist ears. Here is a sampling of such international laws that Israel never recognized when enacted by the United Nations. Resolution 194 established Palestinian refugees' right of return and restitution to their homes, lands, and businesses. Resolution 999 called for Israel without condition to withdraw from the Sinai Peninsula following the Suez Canal War. Resolution 242 demanded Israel withdraw from all occupied territories, emphasizing the inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory by war. Resolution 338 reaffirming 242 and called for its immediate implementation. Resolution 425 called on Israel to withdraw its forces from Lebanon after its invasion of the nation. The list of resolutions goes on and on with words that include the General Assembly or the Security Council strongly deplores, deeply regrets, condemns, censures, demands, calls, declares, expresses deep concern and urges. Words that are telling Israel that what it is doing is illegal and misaligned with UN charters. All in all, there are 131 UN General Assembly resolutions and 92 Security Council resolutions that concern Israel regarding its establishment, its occupation of Palestine, the sovereignty of Arab lands and resources, ceasefires, human rights of refugees, and the use of excessive force. That's a total of 223 laws citing Israeli injustices in the region. How many have they abided by? Seven in total. Six that have to do with its creation, and one approving its admittance into the United Nations as a full member. That's a 3% application rate. But when analyzing it further, and I'll ask you this, what was the application rate for those resolutions that benefited the Jewish nation? As part of the United Nations, the International Court of Justice was created in 1945 to adjudicate disputes between nations and provide legal clarity on international issues. Israel has had a couple of run-ins with the ICJ. In 2004, the ICJ determined that Israel's construction of a wall surrounding Jerusalem and its illegal settlements was contrary to the Geneva Convention and was deemed illegal. Any reaction by Israel? Yes, of course, nothing. The ICJ was completely ignored. In early 2024, the ICJ ruled that Israel was to immediately cease its military operations in Gaza and to take all reasonable measure to prevent genocide. Again, what did the Zionist regime do? Nothing again. The inhumane treatment of the Palestinian people continued on without concern. Since the court's establishment in 2002, nothing has come from the ICC when looking at Israel. In the decades of crimes committed by Israel, zero cases have been filed, let alone any being tried. But the kicker here is that Israel doesn't recognize the ICC. Such a court, Israel states, has no jurisdiction over its actions as a nation. Okay, so by now it's clear that Israel couldn't care less about international law. But what about its own laws and how they might observe or honor international law? If you recall earlier, I mentioned Israel's Declaration of Independence if we look at it, if we look at its content, we can extract the following. By virtue of our natural and historic right and of the resolution of the General Assembly of the United Nations, do hereby proclaim the establishment of a Jewish state in the land of Israel, the State of Israel. The declaration goes on with, It will be loyal to the principles of the United Nations Charter. The State of Israel will be prepared to cooperate with all the organs and representatives of the United Nations in carrying out the General Assembly Resolution of 29 November 1947. So, the declaration states that Israel will honor the United Nations outright, and in referencing the 1947 resolution, the state will respect its method of land partitioning and allocation. 
So what changed? It's not so complicated. They became the more powerful, and hence, the less accountable. The global institutions that the world, and more realistically the ones the Western powers have established, defended, and praised, are without justice, with no teeth or backbone. Without the unbiased support of international law by those in power, they themselves become no more than puppet institutions, only to cry freedom and injustice when it suits the West's agenda. For Israel, the purpose of the United Nations, and overall any international law, was necessary up to a certain point in time. And once Israel got out of these institutions what it wanted, such organizations became insignificant, unnecessary, and unworthy of its respect. What happens when someone believes that they are above the law? And what happens when the institutions that profess freedom and justice project zero integrity? The world is supposed to be governed by law and order, a modern way to conduct ourselves as nations in order to protect the injured, weak, and suppressed. How can anyone convince the Palestinian people of this myth? What recourse do Palestinians have if there is no law that protects their rights or lives? For the Palestinians, the world is in a state of chaos. A world where no rules apply to their occupier. A criminal who has never been held accountable for his actions. And it is in this moment when one can understand the human condition the Palestinian people find themselves in, and what choice they have in terms of recourse. There is only one path in how they can escape their world of chaos, and that path is that of resistance. <laughs>